show. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here. Excited to be on stage together with Greg Berlin. Uh, Greg and I, uh, Greg from MassGuard, uh, and I have been working together over the past two years and here to share a few thoughts on how we de-risk launch of new products. Just before we get started, one, just a quick raise of hands. Um, all product space, we all know how important it is to talk to, product, to customers. How many times a week would you say your team speaks to customers to get feedback on the products that you are building? So to raise of hands, at least 10 customers a week. Okay, we're gonna start this lower. At least one customer a week. Okay, at least one customer a week. Five, keep your hands up if it's five customers a week. Keep your hands up if it's 10 customers a week. Okay, okay. We all know, something is humming. Okay, there we go. We all know how important it is, but why is it that we don't speak to customers more often? We know that we want to build, thank you for that great quote before, we all know we want to build products that solve a real problem for our customers. One of the theories behind it, and one of the things we've been, uh, for which we put together Wevo as a company, is to make it dramatically easier and faster to engage with customers, to collect the feedback, and ensure that that is meaningful quality feedback. And we believe, we've now seen this with multiple Fortune 500 companies that we've been working with, if you make it dramatically easier, and if you make it dramatically more reliable, your teams will speak to customers more often and build better products and de-risk them. Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg said last year that the Facebook meta is in the year of efficiency. I believe we have all entered an era of efficiency. I don't know about your CFOs, but our CFO is dramatically more powerful now and can say all these things that need to be cut in order to reach profitability. We can't afford to give our development teams products that are not going to be successful. We can't afford to spend $10 million on launching a product that fails in market. How do we do that? And that's what Greg is going to be talking about, sharing a great case study from MasterCard. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and towards the end, we'll also talk, well, throughout, we'll, we've been at a conference, nobody said AI for the past 10 minutes. AI. Uh, we'll talk about how AI is helping us do that um, in some interesting, uh, in this interesting space. Uh, so we're about Wevo, and we'll, we'll see the case study in a moment, but basically Wevo was put together in order to help product managers to collect feedback from their customers in a much more efficient and reliable way. And we leverage AI in order to do that. Without further ado, Greg. Cool. Thank you, Nitzan. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Joel, for the, the tee up or chairperson. I think I should refer to you now. Um, I feel bad, though, because there's so many gifts uh, been shared. I'm, I'm not sure I can live up to that. But please ask questions. Raise your hand. Just a quick one to kick us off. Like, um, like how do you see yourselves, folks in the room? Product person, can you raise your hand? You can raise your hand to more than one thing. Product person, okay. CX person, okay. Engineer or R&D or tech, okay. And then business, okay. And maybe there's more. I, I know I'm just doing broad strokes here. Um, but it's really interesting because I'm at the stage of my career where I really am not sure if I'm a CX person or a product person anymore. I'm not sure if anyone else has that dilemma. Um, but what I want to talk to you today, um, we're going to talk to you about driving customer centricity at scale um, and how we've been trying to drive that across the enterprise of products. Um, now, I kind of have one of those jobs which you can't really explain to your parents, or at least I struggle to, uh, mainly because people are like, you work for MasterCard, you work on products. I don't know any MasterCard products, and that's because they're delivered through our partners. They're delivered through, uh, you know, um, our tech partners, through uh, banks, through merchants. Uh, so a lot of the times we're delivering that through an API, or it's a white-labeled solution, uh, and we're helping to enable that and bring it to get uh, bring it to market through our partners. You know, and, and scale for MasterCard tends to be somewhere between 50 and 200 markets that that we're trying to reach. Um, so I want to talk to you around um, an area that I focus the lion's share of my time, which is new product development. Um, I, I work in MasterCard's foundry, so we're, um, I guess 
one of the innovation groups within MasterCard, but uh, far from trying to like own innovation and stifle it and say it can only happen within these walls uh, or virtual walls, what we're trying to also do is, is create the operating system for the enterprise to make sure that the entire company and the entire product organization has the best practices to facilitate um, innovation at scale and, and thinking about how we de-risk product development at scale. So we're going to talk to you about two of those in concept desirability score and design quality score uh, and how we've partnered with Wevo on that journey. And then uh, Nitsan's going to talk to you a little bit about how you can deliver speed to insight. Cool, thank you. Um, so, yeah, th this is kind of a vision we had a couple of years ago and, and fast forward to today, super excited. Like, the entire product organization at MasterCard, 25% of how they are uh, incentivized and measured at year-end performance is based on the customer centricity of their products. So this was a goal we had a couple of years ago. Unless you actually bake it into how people are incentivized, remunerated, it's a side project. So now we've actually reached that sort of milestone stage. And for, for anyone that's been in product or CX for a, for a couple of years, like, I go back even 10, maybe 12 plus years ago where, I don't know if you remember this buzzword, return on experience. Everyone was talking about return on experience. Can we sort of demonstrate and understand the return on CX or product investment? And so what we've tried to do here is because there's a lag time with a lot of the products that we bring to market, um, unfortunately, I, I would love it if it was as simple as working in a D2C world. Um, I used to do that in, in different prior roles um, when I worked at consultancy side. But now working at MasterCard, we're a B2B2C to c company. And so building product tends to be a little bit more complicated. There's, there's regulation, uh, there's different markets to scale in. So there's a lot, lot happening and, and you need to think through. So what we really needed to do, um, there's more metrics, more data-driven decisioning that, that happens beyond this slide, but I guess I'm less focused on that. What, I'm re what I've really been focused on is how in the early stages of new product development, and if we're taking an existing product and bringing it back and thinking about how do we reinvent it, how do we differentiate it, how do we create those sort of leading and lagging indicators that can help us drive product investment decisions, decide if we're going to pivot away from something, if we're going to kill it, or if we're going to double down and, and, and you know, throw the bank at it. Um, so, so the focus here is really like what we build, um, how we design and build it, and then how it's delivered via our partners. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll talk to you about that. Um, and, and really, why is that important? It's because when, when MasterCard builds products, uh, it's not enough for us to just sell those to our partners. That, that's not how we make revenue. We only make revenue when our products get used um, and, and scale through our customers. So in some ways, it's even more important for us to go and do the homework ourselves and understand our end customers, those end users. If we don't do that, then it's not going to resonate and our sales team's going to really struggle to, to sort of sell to uh, tech companies, uh, merchants, um, banks, etc. Okay, so... I think Joel, you had your own version of this quote, but um, so, so one of the monikers I have for my team is design the right thing before designing the thing right. And I kind of feel like if Albert Einstein was here today, he, he would be this kind of design thinker. He would be this kind of product person, right? Because you're focusing on the problem space first. Um, and, and one thing I've, I've really seen that's so important is when I see business cases being thrown around, a lot of the time they're predicated on, um, you know, TAM. To, total addressable market, which, which is kind of BS, to be honest, if I can use that term, because it has to be on the total addressable problem. So a lot of what we're trying to focus on is, is what is that, that TAP, to use an acronym, uh, sm small sort of secret mascot. Unless it's a, an acronym, it doesn't matter. We, there's, there's, there's too much kind of jargon floating around. So you know you've hit the big time when it's an acronym. But, but you know, it, it is, you know, expensive, um, becomes very expensive very quickly if, um, you know, you end up with technical debt that you're carrying through uh, deeper and deeper into the product um, life cycle. Then egos get attached to it, and it's kind of like, when do you pull the plug on something? So having this decision-making up front is much more important. Um, so we've all seen this. I'm sure we've all seen the double diamond. Um, we've all probably done a, a D-school class over the years. Um, 
or gone to school on this, but hopefully this is what human-centered design looks like. Um, so it's finding the right problem, designing the right solution. So you have that initial problem or opportunity, you discover actionable insights, you define the areas to focus on. Hopefully you have an informed problem statement, and hopefully what you're doing here is that sort of divergent and convergent thinking. You're exploring multiple com concepts. Uh, it's not just the highest paid person in the room that's got an idea and you're following that, hopefully. Uh, and then you're designing the right solution. So developing ideas for potential solutions and then prototyping and test it to see that it works. And you're hopefully doing, we, we call it experience prototyping. So you're really understanding and doing re iterative research. Um, and, and to me, um, one of the challenges I've seen um, you know, and, and challenges and frictions I find between, you know, sometimes engineering and product people is uh, everyone throws around Jake Knapp's sprint book, right? How many people have read Jake Knapp's sprint book? How many people? Can read it or, or reference it, use it, yeah. So I love that, and I, I, I will say when I was in the consulting side, found it very easy to replicate a sort of one-week uh, sprint cycle, I will say client side, it tends to be more like a two-week sprint cycle, if I'm honest. There's just a lot more stuff going on, and, and you're, you're much closer to the go-to-market. Um, but what I will say is I think there's this assumption that you immediately get to that sprint cycle, that design uh, cycle. The reality is you don't. Um, and I want to talk a little bit around what, what I think kind of needs to predicate getting to that sprint cycle. Um, I don't, I don't want to throw a New York bestseller uh, under the bus because I'm, I'm probably not going to win that argument. But um, here's what I think the process often looks like. I call this the fish. Um, and so what this is, is some market research, some definition of a business opportunity, jump to a single concept, or maybe it's the same idea that the highest paid person had in the first place, find someone's prototype and maybe test it, and then you get to the actual solution. And what you've done there is just spend a whole bunch of money taking something through a design process. You already knew this idea. That you may as well just got the whole engineering team on board from day one and said, we're building this. Um, now, I could go and talk about many examples, like go to a number of these conferences and everyone sort of references Jack Bezo, um, Jeff Bezos and the Fire Phone or Quibi. Um, but we all kind of know that this is a bad idea, yet it still happens a lot of the time. Um, so the point here, and, and I wonder, I, I see there's like some, some design imperfection here, so I'm wondering now if it's because iterate is there, uh, it's very meta, but um, is it better to iterate, you know, early on or, or down there somewhere in, in the sort of 50th sprint cycle? So I guess this is that concept of fail fast. Um, we, you know, we're all trying as product people to, to always kind of sort of celebrate these fails but I don't know about you, that, that sometimes is a friction. Like, okay, we've got to celebrate these failures, but hang on, I've got to meet year end. So how do you do that and, and make sure that everyone's happy and make sure that you don't end up with technical debt? Um, IEE, um, sort, of a, sort of Institute for Electrical Engineers, um, they, they say that engineers and, and programmers um, spend 50% of their time on code that basically gets thrown away, which is a crazy statistic. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the concept desirability score and design quality score. Um, look, this is not necessarily anything groundbreaking or special. Every, every company that I've seen into, when you're a consultant, you get to see inside every company and, and see that there's a similar kind of design thinking or product development approach. This is what ours looks like. Um, but what we are trying to do is embed best practices and tools for driving customer centricity in the design and delivery of our products. So Mastercard Foundry, where I work, we have about 30 products. So, so we're trying to take on the, the riskiest bets that the company's making um, uh, because we have a really strong sort of uh, balance of engineering, CX and D and product. Um, and then across the company, there's 800 products in our product catalog. So another role that we're doing is trying to create this sort of uh, enterprise muscle, if you will, uh, around getting really good at this everywhere across the company. Um, 
So, concept desirability score. So, are we designing the right what in the first place? Um, again, remember we're trying to design the right thing in the first place. Um, so, what this is, uh, and, and a sort of model that we built out with Weibo, is, is really um, an ability to test that out, and it's based on three diagnostics, comprehension, relevance, and value. Um, and so, What's really interesting is these were equally weighted to begin with, comprehension. Um, do end customers really um, comprehend the purpose of the product, the features, the other characteristics of the experience? Um, do end customers want this concept? Do they find it relevant to their needs and situation? And, and do value, do they um, feel that the value proposition and the benefits uh, of the concept really resonate? And what's important here is we have a score. So that, that chart I showed you before, um, the, the new product development approach that we have, um, you now have a score and you have a cross-functional team that votes. There's a product council, we call it, and they basically have uh, the, the scoring mechanism, you know, okay, based on what's come back, it's not ready, uh, we're getting closer, there's some key areas that should be addressed before progressing, it's um, acceptable or it's outstanding, it's ready to proceed. And funding is directly connected to this. So the good thing about this is it's, again, it's accountable. Remember I said all product people are now measured based on the quality of their customer experience. That's, that's part of what they're remunerated and measured on at year end. And then you have these product councils connected to that, that um, product development life cycle. And you've got this ability to sort of stage gate it, pull the plug, pivot, or progress based, based on how you are. Um, focusing, and it also enables those early discussions to be had around, um, you know, build, partner, um, or, or buy, potentially. So this is what it looks like. Can we have the sound? Shape a truly differentiate. Let me go back. First video of the day. Okay. At MasterCard, we understand that it takes a lot of hard work and dedication to shape a truly differentiated product. But we also understand that not all products are created equal. When it comes to product development, we need to design the right thing before designing it right. That's why we created the Concept Desirability Score, or CDS. It helps determine which ideas are valuable and relevant to end customers. Studies are hosted on the Weevil platform, where all results are supported by feedback from hundreds of real people your target end customers who react to a product's concept, its relevance, comprehension, and perceived value. Participants' reactions expose these leading indicators of a product's potential early on, helping to de-risk design downstream in a way we've never been able to do before. Great concepts make for extraordinary experiences. Begin your journey to designing the right thing. Get started with CDS today. Cool, okay, and um, that, that's CDS. This is design quality score, and I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, but, uh, and reflect on these. Um, but design quality score, so remember I was talking about this in the concept phase, now we're in prototype phase. This is where we actually have a, a fully fledged prototype. Uh, we're looking at different flows, we're experimenting with those. Um, maybe there's areas that we want to learn more about. Um, and so we're agreeing on what that prototype is, and then we're doing a design quality score on it. And this isn't just one and done. What we're also doing is running multiple uh, design quality scores. So we'll also do this in market test. So in prototype, it's still somewhat theoretical. We kind of know or think we know what existing customers and new customers our products are going to be relevant uh, for. And when we get to market test, we're actually going out with live uh, pilots and, and, and code. Um, and, and so then, you know, it becomes much more um, specific in terms of that customer, that market, that context. But we run these design quality scores and this helps us really iterate. So we've got a couple more stage gates there, again, where this score is kind of critical to um, that product council making a decision. It impacts the, the, the sort of budgeting decisions. Um, and, and it's now mandated as well. So uh, people can't get away from this, uh, which is, is good and bad. And it has meant that we've 
constantly worked with Weibo to sort of optimize this process so that it doesn't just work for consumers, no matter who that end user is. Um, the idea is that we can go out and recruit that uh, end user wherever they are, whether they're working in a small, medium business, whether they're uh, working in accounts receivables, whether they're a consumer, uh, whether they're working in a, a treasury function at a bank uh, managing liquidity. So wh whatever they're doing, we, we work on that criteria. Um, we get what we feel is, is enough of a representation, normally, normally somewhere between sort of uh, 100 and 150 uh, participants. Um, and again, because the idea of this is not that it's you know, representative uh, necessarily, um, but that we're doing more of these, that it's iterative. Um, the other thing I would say is that alongside this, we still have uh, mixed method sort of research uh, beyond the CX metrics. But the great thing about these CX metrics is that these are really your testing points, your proof points. If you've done a ton of other research, if you've gone and done ethnography, if you've brought them into uh, a physical lab and, and set up um, you know, a, a checkout experience, whatever that might be, ultimately at some point you need a consistent yardstick or measure uh, where you can stand back and say, how does this stack up? Um, what degree of confidence that do we think that this is going to succeed in the market? I think we have a question. So just curious, does everything go through this process or do you have some ideas that buck the trend and they're like, we're good, we're going to skip this process because we're so confident? Yeah, so we, um, we made this a mandate uh, in September of last year. Um, but what I would say is, what we're finding is that 90% of the time, every time, I feel like I'm quoting uh, a famous, uh, famous film that many of you have maybe watched. Um, it, but we are still finding those 10%, to be honest, where um, it doesn't quite fit, maybe because, uh, I'll give you an example, some products we're working on, we work with scheme operators, right? Scheme operators define the kind of uh, rules, basically, of, of payment schemes. And uh, pff, there's only so many of them in the world, so we can't we can't expect to get you know 125 of those folks um, and screen for those people and run them through this. So we do our best in those scenarios, and we switch it out and we do a proxy. We do, we'll do a dif different study in that scenario. Maybe a number of interviews that help us validate things. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes there is a get out of jail card, but. We try and keep that quiet because otherwise we'd have everyone trying to game the system and say, hey, this doesn't apply to me. And, and sometimes you do have new parts of the business come into that. And that, that's been the great thing to see, actually. Sometimes there's a, you know, skepticism from people new to this. And they'll be like, oh, this is another hoop I need to jump through. But what we're finding actually now is we flip that mentality where people see, oh, if I actually do this correctly, if I invest in this process, I can actually get more funding because I've got the proof point. So we're kind of switching that, you know, uh, carrot stick model, I guess. Um, so there's a little bit of stick in there, but we're trying to make a, a larger carrot, if that makes sense. Um, cool. Um, this is a quick example. This is, uh, I'll just go through this really quickly. This launched um, actually earlier this month. So this is a smart subscriptions uh, product. Um, it's launched, it goes through uh, your ban banking application, whoever you bank with. As long as your uh, payment method is linked to uh, a subscription that you might have with various different subscriptions, you can now go into your banking application, um, you can look at individual spend analysis, uh, expenditure categorization, um, you can get personalized offers. So it allows you to cancel, pause, resume your subscriptions. Um, and interestingly, there's a lot of regulation coming out in various markets around the fact that a lot of uh, business models that offer subscriptions, they make it untenably difficult to get out of that subscription. It's very easy to sign up, very difficult to get out of it. Um, so this is actually something that we went through uh, a design quality score. You can see there it didn't pass... Uh, you know the the, the scoring, um, so had to go back, revisit. There needs to be there needed to be more sort of iterative design. Um, we had to consolidate, simplify the experience down to priority features. Had to focus on uh, visuals that really communicated the data in a more intuitive way, um, and added in an insights view that was more sort of personalised. So um, it's paying off, I guess. 
Greg, thank you for sharing that. I think um, uh, MasterCard has reached probably a gold standard in taking in the voice of the customer and using that as a metric to decide if products, now every product, or well, 90% of products as we heard today, um, will advance to the engineering stage or not in order to tackle this problem of engineers working on product that gets thrown away or major launches that fail. Um, how do we make it more reachable for others as well and not just MasterCard. MasterCard is a great example and we're very happy with the partnership. A lot of this was driven with Greg's vision. Um, and now we put this in the hands of many others. Weaver works with a number of large corporations, um, medium-sized corporations as well. The emphasis is on effortless, making it so that it's less than 30 minutes to launch the study, to uh, read the results because they're summarized, because they're ready to go. Um, reliable uh, because we're using over 120 people uh, and for all that anybody in the organization can use it not just user researchers not just product managers but designers and marketers uh, as well uh, given time I, I want to open it up for questions as well I just want to tell you uh, of the latest product that we just launched two months ago um, all of this <laughs> training based now on AI alone so um, if you want to get feedback on a product that you're designing or on a live product or on a competitor's product, you can now do that within five minutes. We've basically taken a large language model and trained it to be very specialized on user experience, on copy, on basically what over one million user participants said in real live user studies. And this model now is available to anyone. If you want to try it out, um, go now today to wevo.ai slash take a pulse. Um, it's free in the beginning. Uh, we do the free trial model. Um, and you'll be able within five minutes to get an evaluation of any experience you have, uh, any marketing material you have. Um, by next week, you'll also get quantitative. Greg talked a lot about the quantitative side as well, right? So today's version is qualitative. We're introducing quantitative assessment next week as well, how trusted it is, how valuable it is, how intuitive it is for customers. Again, think of an AI that's just honed in and trained on user experience. I want to open it up for questions. I think we have uh, just unfortunately two, two minutes, no minutes? No, unfortunately not. But. Uh, sorry, time first first time okay. cop check. Sorry, apologies. But Wevo does have a booth outside, so they can come visit you there. Absolutely, our booth is just as you enter on the left hand side. Cool. And Greg is also here, so yep. we've got several breaks. We've got lunch to go and chat with Greg. I know there's a million things that I want to chat with you about, and thanks for the new acronym cool. that I've already sent to tap, <laughs> tap, tap, tap. Thank you guys so much. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.